start the recording. So I welcome everybody. And as I was saying before I hit the record button, we have two more, more sessions besides today. Tomorrow will be the session uh, at 6 p.m. and on Friday at 5 p.m. Um, if you want to come to our premises, you are more than welcome to come to the premises and have also an opportunity to chat more directly with our guests. Without further ado, uh, I leave the floor to Professor Magdaleno so that he can start his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for coming this, this afternoon to join the second session of the week about organizational processes that we are uh, teaching this week. Today, as uh, Robert was saying, it's uh, about job performance, another very important organizational process. I guess that uh, I am already sharing the presentation, right? If, uh, if you cannot see the presentation, please say it. But uh, in principle, you should be seeing the title of the presentation already. So uh, thanks again, the university, for hosting me. And Professor Robert Duval for organizing and taking care of everything, and also uh, Erato. And uh, without further ado, we are going to, to start talking about um, uh, job performance. But before that, I would like to take again one issue that we discussed on the previous session that was about well-being. And some people uh, were interested in researching a little bit more about measurements of well-being. So I brought here today some uh, main references on the topic of measurement of well-being. So you have them here, OK? So you are going to have this presentation, and you can, uh, you can check these references uh, with more detail when you have it. I brought eudaimonic and hedonic uh, measurements, and also measures that contain both eudaimonic and hedonic. Some of them are more classical, and some of them are more modern. So it is here for you to, to start uh, reading a little bit more about this. So talking about job performance. Job performance is uh, a very huge construct, the same that we said about well-being. We are talking about huge con constructs in this in these lectures of this week. And uh, the same that happened with uh, well-being, many concepts fall under this umbrella of uh, job performance. There are many concept conceptualizations, and we are going to make an overview of, uh, of the main ones in the literature. Job performance has been a very important concept in organizations, especially from management, because management has been very interested in extracting the full employee potential, right? Because as we said in the previous presentation, uh, job performance leads to organizational performance. Organizations are nothing without their people working for them. So I wanted to start the presentation with an example so you can see what job performance is about and two main distinction uh, a main distinction of uh, two different kinds of uh, performance that we are going to show here as an example and then we take afterwards to explain a, bit, a little bit more about this main differentiation so on the first on the on the left hand we have uh, maria she is an employee that is focused on the task. She has a checklist of things to do in her shift. So she is very well organized and does one thing after another. She does everything that is expected of her from the organization. So everything that is written in the job description, she follows that and she performs that very well. And if she has to choose between achieving her daily goals at working and doing networking at work, she goes with goals. Okay. And on the right side of the screen, we have Petros. Petros is a different kind of worker. He likes to help co-workers whenever there is the opportunity. 
he does extra working hours, so you can see that he's also a good worker. I'm not saying that they are different in the quality of the work that they are doing. Uh, they, their approach is just different. Petros, with his efforts, he strengthens team building and cohesion. He uh, takes every opportunity that he has to, to make team building, right? To make networking at work, to build cohesion. He maintains the formal procedures also on communication channels. He is uh, supporting the context of the of the job, right? So I, I did this, this differentiation here and Afterwards, we are going to retake it because it is obeying to one main distinction of, uh, of the two more classical dimensions of job performance. So what is job performance? I'm going to take a very broad definition because, as I was saying, job performance is a very broad concept. So these authors here said in the review of the literature that there is agreement in the literature to define job performance as things that people actually do, actions they take, that contribute to the organization's goals. So everything that employees do that is aligned with organization's objectives can be considered job performance. Okay, so as you can see, this is very broad and, and can uh, contain all the factors that we are going to discuss in the, in the next um, slides. Job performance is focused on the behavior, of the behavior of the employee. Why? Because the behavior is the, the part that we can see. We have the personality of the employee. We have the mind of the employee, but we don't really see that, those parts. What we see is the behavior and what is measurable and quantifiable is the behavior. So we have to focus on that. But not just any behavior, but only those that can provide value to the organization or is aligned with its goals, as I was saying. Everything that has value for the organization can be considered job performance. It is a very broad definition that can cover all the aspects that can be considered job performance. So, we need to distinguish job performance first with other related concepts because it has a very rich semantic field. So we talked about behaviors. A behavior is something that is more general. Behavior is what people do in any non-specific context. But then when we are talking about behaviors that happen at work and that go with the goals with, of the organization, we talk about your performance. What is expected and valued behavior at work is your performance. And we also have the employee results. The results of the employee are outcomes that the organization gets at the end of the day as a result of having that employee working for, for it. Sometimes it's due to causes not attributable to the employee because everything that the organization gets as a result is not dependent directly from the employee. I'm going to show you an example here. For example, the economic situation of a country could have an effect on an employee sales volume, an employee that is dedicated to sales, for example, without these employees having necessarily anything to do in that reduction in selling volume of that period. Maybe employees are working hard, they are performing, they have a very good job performance, but they don't get results for the organization due to external causes like, for example, uh, an economic crisis. So everything that the organization gets from the employee is not necessarily job performance. So it's important to make that distinction. Other concepts that can be um, compound with uh, job performance is, for example, those that, see, that, that you see here, effectiveness or productivity is the part of the results that are attributable to the employee. Okay, so what the outcomes that the, that the organization gets from the employee as a result of the employee performance is this effectiveness or productivity. And the efficiency is the same as uh, effectiveness or productivity, but taking into account the costs, okay, because 
as you know, employees don't work for free. There is there are many costs associated with with uh, with them having to work in the organization. Not only the salary, but other concepts like, for example, the cost of of opportunity of having those employees doing those specific tasks in, instead of other um, materials, uh, supplies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, when we do the, the, the calculation, uh, reducing the cost or considering the cost, we have the efficiency, the final efficiency. Okay. And we also have other concepts that are more easily distinguishable from their performance, like knowledge, skills, attitudes, because you can understand that they are preconditions or conditions to, to perform well. An employee needs to have certain knowledge, to have certain skills, and even attitudes before starting performing for an organization. Okay, if, uh, for example, you don't have uh, uh, the necessary knowledge about sales, you probably probably won't sell as as well as another one that does. So I'm going to start talking about the main. Um, Perform, job performance factors, and I'm going to start with the main differentiation about the two main factors that are considered in the literature, which are task performance and contextual performance. What you're going to see here in these slides are very technical uh, definitions, but don't worry, we are going to comment about them. Task performance can be uh, defined as the effectiveness to contribute to the organizational technical core, either directly by implementing a part of its technological process or indirectly by providing it with needed materials or services. Very technical definition, but what this referring to is that the employee is doing what is expected from the employee from the job description, even from the job offer, if it's very detailed. Right? When the supervisor is socializing a new employee in the organization and he's telling him or her what to do, that's the task performance. What you have to do in your job is your task performance. So if you are complying or fulfilling those uh, conditions, you can say that you are performing, performing from this point of view of task performance. And on the other side, we have contextual performance. I'm going to read the definition first. It's the shaping of the organizational, social, and psychological context. This word is very important. That serves as the catalyst for task activities and processes and include volunteering to carry out activities that are not formally part of the job and helping and cooperating with others in the organization to get tasks done. As you can see, it's also a very technical definition, but it's referring exactly to the opposite or to the complementary side of task performance. What is not expected from the employee to do, what is not written in the job description, but the employee does, that is contextual performance. But when it's good for the organization, when it's valuable, of course, from the organ for the organization, because it has to obey the, the main definition that we gave be before. It has to be behaviors that are valuable for the organization, that bring any value or are aligned with the objectives of the organization. The context, we are referring to the context because it's what surrounds task performance. When we talk about the others that is all also highlighted here in this definition, because it's related to that social part, to helping others, to make the climate be favorable to perform, to work teamly, to do activities that are not part of the job, but you want to do them, even when your boss does not demand you to do them, but you do it, and you can say that you are performing from this contextual point of view. Okay, so when you think of these two factors, I would like that it reminded you of Martin and Petros that we started talking about. 
we could say that Martina had more task performance oriented behaviors because she was uh, strictly doing what was expected of her. She had a checklist even of the, of the duties that uh, she has to do. She had uh, uh, a job description that she follows. But on the other hand, Petros was working more on the networking, on the climate, on helping others, on creating a good context. So I hope that with, with these examples, you can see better the difference between task and contextual performance. If I am insisting more on these two factors, it's between, it's between these two factors appear in almost every taxonomy of job performance that is considered or studied in the literature. There can be variations, but these two, maybe with other names, as you are going to see, are always included. For example, contextual performance has also a broad semantic field. And uh, there are other concepts that also relate to contextual performance. Even some of them can be identifiable, like the second one that you see here, organizational citizenship behavior. It's actually identifiable with uh, contextual performance, but it's good that we mention these concepts here. So when you hear about any of these concepts, you know that we are really talking about contextual performance or something that is very, very, very similar. Contextual performance, as I was saying, is the shaping of the organizational, social, and psychological context that serves them as a catalyst for task activities and processes. And organizational citizenship behavior refers to those behaviors that contribute to the maintenance and enhancement of the social and psychological context that supports task performance. You really see that they are identifiable. Uh, the thing is that they come from two different traditions in literature that has that have come to the same or very, very similar conclusion. But it's good that we mention organizational citizenship behavior here. Extra role performance is also a very uh, similar concept to contextual performance but it has some nuances that we can discuss a little bit. Extra role performance refers to behaviors that benefit or are intended to benefit the organization. The clue here is the word intended because uh, contextual and organizational citizenship behavior are always supposed to be good for the, for the organization, but extra role performance, even when, they, when it has the intention to, to be always good for the organization, there are some cases where it finally hinders it. Like, for example, whistleblowing about uh, colleague behavior at work can be considered by the, by the organization as a good thing because you are getting information about the behavior and we need to do something about it. But in the end, it can um, create a toxic climate that in that can hinder the, the organization, right? So this is more broad than contextual performance. And we also have prosocial or organizational behavior. This is more specific and is only related to behaviors that are intended to promote the welfare of individuals or groups in the organization. This is a more social concept of all and is only related to, to making a good climate to give social support, to do things for, for other people in the organization, to help others, okay? For social, you know, the name says it all. If you had to stay with one taxonomy of job performance, I would recommend you that you stay with this one. This is the most established taxonomy nowadays in the literature about job performance. And as you can see, it considers task performance and contextual performance that are already defined and introduces another one that is counterproductive work behavior. What is this concept that we uh, uh, make it short by CWD? They are behaviors that harm the organization or go against its interests. And now you might think, 
what wasn't what, when you say that uh, job performance should be in line of the interest of the organization yes but this is a variable that is imperfect that is considered and measured negatively so it should be as little as possible as small as possible in our in an organization and it gives a very good idea of a very important concept because if you have people that are doing things that are against your organ or organization when you are evaluating your performance you should know about this so any action that goes against the organizational goals can be considered CW. okay to depend a little bit more about uh, counterproductive work behaviors what are examples of or categories in this case of uh, counterproductive behaviors you can see here a list theft of related behavior destruction of property misuse of information like falsifying information lying or not keeping organizational secrets misuse of time and resources reckless behavior what we are talking about security directives lack of attention you see that this is also a very concept uh, broad concept that even lack of attention can be considered that goes against the organization uh, goals right low quality of work the same consideration we can say about it. use and abuse of alcohol and drugs of course if you get if you use drugs at work that's not a good thing at all verbal abuse swearing insults physical or sexual abuse mobbing sexual harassment all those things can be considered CWB categories the most common uh, on the other hand are not necessarily the ones that we just mentioned we have a, le a list here of the most common that uh, happen more often in the organizations the use of email for personal purposes make photocopies of personal material using the internet or the smartphone for non-work related purposes make personal arrangement of, of when you are at work ignoring the risk prevention directives that's not only bad for the organization but also bad for the employee because you take a risk of injuring yourself excessive time for meals or coffee instead of 10 minutes you take half an hour to, to drink that coffee or smoke that cigarette Argu arguing with co-workers wasting time faking an illness so as not to go to work as you can see you, you don't need to be at work to commit CWB. You can be even taking an illness not to go to work. So you can see here a list of examples so you, so you can make an idea of what this concept is about. There are other um, job performance taxonomies. I, uh, I put here uh, a couple of them that can be interesting. They can be more comprehensive for example this one uh, of Bartram can be interesting because it introduces other concepts that we don't uh, we haven't discussed before like the creativity aspect or the adaptive or supporting cooperating or even leadership for example leadership and behaviors but uh, the thing is that with the broad uh, taxonomy what, that we just mentioned of Goodman's tal we can really uh, uh, include all of these uh, factors in one of the three uh, dimensions, right? As I was saying, some other interesting job performance behaviors that are worth at least mentioning here that are considered in, in other taxonomies like the ones that we just saw creative performance for example it's a very interesting uh, kind of performance that is related to the creation of products ideas or procedures that satisfy two conditions one that they are novel or original and two that they are potentially relevant or, or useful to an organization so uh, this can be included in, in some organizations in task performance because if you think for example of a technological company that is always creating new applications for example 
uh, you could say and argue with uh, a lot of reason that that's part of the past performance of those employees, right? Um, innovative behavior is very similar to creative performance. The creative performance is only the creation part, the cognitive part, and the innovative behavior is the action, the implementation, the application of those novel ideas. It's defined as the intentional application of ideas, processes, products, or procedures new to the units of adoption designed to significantly benefit the organization. As I was saying, also with creative performance, it can be more important for specific organizations and for other, it doesn't uh, really make any sense. For example, for very bureaucratic organizations, um, these uh, two dimensions maybe are not so interesting to measure. Adapt adaptive performance is also related to, to these variables. It's uh, the extent to which an individual adapts to changes in, uh, in his uh, uh, role as a worker, right? In a work system or work roles. The, uh, how easily that person adapts to new, uh, to, to new challenges, to new job positions. So after we have seen um, what is job performance and uh, the main dimensions that are mentioned in the literature, let's go to talk about how to measure job performance. How do we measure performance in organizations? That this, uh, I think, might be more interesting to know uh, because in the end what we want to know is how to measure it to, uh, to foster it, right? And have employees that are performing at their best. Um, at first, a puntualization that I want to make is that in the case of job performance, we have measures in the literature about job performance, but are more research oriented for academic purposes. In the organizations, it is usually done through performance appraisals. That is a, an HR practice that we are going to describe in the next slides. So the, the HR practice of performance appraisals. Uh, I put here something that is quite interesting uh, before defining it. It is something that is given by someone who does not want to give it to someone who does not want to get it. But what is it? Uh, there are two main ways of doing performance appraisals. The informal way or the formal way. The informal way usually consists of uh, supervisors noting and informally judging the performance of their subordinates on a daily basis. It's just observation by the superior and making judgments that can be explicit or not, that can be expressed or not, that uh, help uh, the supervisor to make decisions afterwards. It's still the use of most small and middle-sized companies and even some of the big. And this is a source of bias because we only have uh, one, one person usually making judges, judgments. Sorry. And uh, uh, it is much better to do it in a formal way so we can avoid uh, those biases and uh, make final conclusions that are more reliable and rapid. So from a formal way perspective, we can define performance appraisals as uh, formal systems to obtain information about the employee's contribution to the company, being the final aim to contribute to the company improvement through the employee's development. And this is very important. Through the employee's development, we want to develop the employees. We don't want to control them. We don't want to administer them. We want them to thrive, to to develop in our organization. And if we make it from a formal procedure, we have more reliable results, if done correctly, of course. What are the goals of the performance appraisals? I already gave some hints, but to get information, to make administrative decisions related to personnel, compensation, contract renewals, layoffs, promotions. This is often uh, a goal of the performance appraisals. 
but it is usually seen as control from the from a hierarchical structure to the from the ones that are on the top to the ones that are in the middle and the bottom. So I wouldn't recommend, and the literature says that it is not recommendable to make performance appraisals to control or to make administrative decisions about personnel. It is much better to pro to to have development objectives because it is much better to have a developed personnel than a controlled personnel, right? So you want to provide feedback to employees about their performance, okay? And it can also serve to evaluate HR practices as a feedback to the organization itself to improve every every time that they apply the, the performance appraisal or other human resources practices. When we design a performance appraisal system, we, we need to make ourselves a series of questions. For example, do we want to evaluate results or processes? From what we said before, maybe you think that results, of course, are not are not always uh, attributable to the employees because they are external factors that affect positively or negatively to the to the results that the employee gets to his or her effectiveness, right, or efficiency. So we rather um, evaluate the processes, the behavior in the, the the performance. To evaluate quantity or quality. In most cases, it, it's better to, uh, to assess the quality. It will depend on the kind of industry or, or sector, but in most cases, we will go for quality. Okay? To evaluate traits or behaviors. Of course, we are talking all the time about behaviors, so we focus on behaviors. Personality traits are very difficult to change and should be already assessed in the selection part of the of the stay of the employee in that organization, right? Because they are quite immutable. So you don't expect to to change a lot their personality traits. So focus better on behaviors. And what kind of performance do we want to uh, evaluate? Task performance, contextual performance, counterproductive performance, other kind of performance. Depending on the kind of industry, for example, if you are an IT company, you want to evaluate creative performance, innovative performance. Task is, all, is always desirable to, to be evaluated. With contextual performance, it can be also a good idea, but uh, beware that sometimes when you introduce contextual be be behaviors in your performance appraisals, with time they become task behavior because if you are evaluating behaviors that are not part of the job description that are not required from the employee in the end if you are evaluating them the employees are going to feel that those behaviors are becoming part of the job and they have to do them right so you can do but uh, take that in mind that that can happen Counterproductive behaviors are difficult to measure because there is a, an honesty issue. Of course, if you ask someone if uh, he or she has stolen something in the last year in the organization, they're probably going to say no. But uh, it is always good to at least have this in mind or ask it in a different way and always ensuring that the results are going to be totally uh, anonymous, anonymous, okay? Or at least confidential, because if you are evaluating persons one by one, uh, sometimes it's not possible to make it anonymous, but at least confidential, okay? But as I was saying, uh, it is very difficult to, to measure counterproductive behaviors. We need to have a multi-source evaluation that we're going to discuss later, maybe to, to get ideas about this behavior. Beware of common biases, because when we assess the behavior of our subordinates or collaborators, it is very common to fall into this kind of biases, like for example, leniency. Effect. The fact that we always rate positively 
our employees or with the top uh, rating because we don't want any trouble. We want them to be happy and we just uh, want to do this as fast as possible and move to another thing. But then if you do this, uh, it's not really uh, useful to do a performance appraisal because if you are uh, rating everyone with a positive, uh, with the highest rating, then it's, it's pointless. The same with central tendency. The fact that you always rate central, for example, if the scale is from one to five, you rate everyone with a three. That's not informative. So we should uh, be, aware, be aware of that and try to avoid it. The fatigue, sometimes evaluators have to assess the, the whole staff in one day or two days or in a week. And sometimes we have a lot of people working for us. And of course, the, the human factor, the fatigue factor can be playing a role. So take that in mind. The hello effect, the famous hello effect, evaluating a person on the basis of one characteristic. For example, that person is good at sailing, at selling, and we assess the rest of characteristics of that employee based on that characteristic. So in order to reduce this effects and other, uh, a common trend is to do multi-source evaluation. What is multi-source evaluation uh, or performance appraisal? It's involving more actors. Traditionally, it's the supervisors who, uh, who evaluate the employees, but we can include other, other um, actors. The first one is the interested one, the, the employee himself or herself. Um, so we have a, a differentiation here depending on the number of actors evaluating the employee. It can be 90, etc. So with the 90 degrees uh, multi-source performance appraisal, we have the supervisor rating the employee and the employee himself rating himself. With the 180 degrees evaluation, we have uh, the same as before, but we add the peers. Of course, when we start including more people, we need to be more aware about the confidentiality issue. This is very important, especially when the when the staff is small, because if you get evaluations from peers, if the if the staff is small, maybe you you know who is rating you and and what is rating the person about you, right? So you make even uh, the decision of not doing, uh, or not involving the peers because the, the characteristics of the organization don't recommend it. So this is a decision, okay? It depends on the, on the characteristics of the organization. We have 360 degrees, the same as the, the one before, but we also include the subordinates. The subordinates, of course, can rate the performance of their superior. Why do we assume that the supervisor is the one that has to always uh, rate their, their employees? It can also happen otherwise uh, from the other side, subordinates uh, rating the superior, the supervisor. And we have the last step that is 360 degrees plus. That is like the one before, but we also include the users or clients, okay? The client source user is a very interesting source of information, okay? And it's in principle quite uh, impartial because they don't work there, so they really don't have an interest or they they are assumed to have less biases, right? So this is a decision that you can make to include one, two, three, or more actors in your performance appraisal. As, as more actors that you include, the more complex and difficult is going to implement and, and costly also to implement this evaluation. But probably you will have more reliable results. So the, the objectives of this kind of performance appraisal are similar to the development goals that I was mentioning before, to know the performance of each one of those evaluated according to the competencies required, detect areas of opportunity 
you can see here, the development as, as well, to carry out precise actions to improve the performance of the employees. We are avoiding to talk about administrative decisions, lays off, promotions. Okay, we want to focus on development, at least in a first phase, right? So how do we implement a multi-source performance appraisal? I'm going to go through, a, through four stages, describing a little bit in detail how to perform this. So I can give you a hint of uh, ideas of how to do this uh, face by face. First of all, we need to, to make a preparation of it. It is very important that the team leaders strategically and carefully inform. The communication is fundamental here the entire team staff of the implementation of this evaluation model. If we don't communicate properly what we are going to do, it can be a bad thing rather than a good thing. We can create um, a, a bad climate. Uh, we can uh, create rumors. And that's, that's really a cancer in organizations. It's better that the employees know from us, as managers, what we are going to do in their performance operations, OK? So we need to clearly explain the purpose of this uh, multi-source feedback process. That is the commi uh, a commitment by the organization to the development of all its members. To emphasize the confidentiality of the process. As I was saying, maybe we, do, we cannot ensure anonymity because we, we want to have individual results, but at least ensure the confidentiality. Make evaluations in a private place and be, be sure that there are no leaks in information, okay? Of, about the, the results of each individual appraisal. Guarantee to the employees that the results of the process will not be used to exercise disciplinary measures. Training those who will participate in the process on the purpose, the formats to be used and the roles to be played, even if we include the users or, or the clients, we can, rapidly explain a little bit, if it's a form that they have to uh, fill out, explain a little bit how they have to do it. Acquiring a commitment to the transparency and equity of the, of the evaluation process. See that we are, going, we are talking about communication and transparency of the process, but the results are the ones that have to be confidential, okay? It's important to, to make this differentiation. So, we, secondly, have to design the, the appraisal. The ideal thing would be to create a, a committee that will take care of the, of the form, of the form that we are going to apply, create a committee that uh, will develop the format and the procedure to carry out the performance appraisals. The committee will identify through input from potential evaluators and team leader three to five critical competencies. So what is important for the job? What competencies, what knowledges, abilities, and attitudes are important to carry out this job, to perform this job? So make a list. If we want to make it simple, from three to five, because if we are going to include more actors, we, we want to make it simple. For each of those competencies, four to five specific descriptions of the expected behavior. So for example, if you are evaluating the competence of selling, you make a description, for example, of a behavior that would consist of the employee sells this specific volume of product, 400 euros per week, for example. Okay, so the writer has a very clear idea if that uh, criterion has been accomplished or not. So the idea is to make it easy for the evaluator. Competencies and descriptions are incorporated into the writing format. After we design it, we have to execute it. We have to implement it. So uh, we have to take into account that the evaluators will be notified that they have to evaluate some, some things so uh, the, the, the aspect that I'm explaining can be obvious, but in practice, we see that we commit a lot of mistakes that can be easily avoided. So if we notify the actors, 
moreover, when we are including more actors than usual, because we are talking about multi-source, it is important to notify all of them, all the ones that are going to participate, that they are going to participate on certain day and certain uh, hour, okay? And the format, electronically or paper. Before scoring, raters should be oriented how to understand how the process will be carried out and what its goal is to avoid hello, central tendency, biases, or other. the evaluators have to complete the, the questionnaire. Okay, so that's exactly the execution thing or phase. And the data of the evaluators will be integrated, analyzed, and converted into the final report of the person. And that's where the final and integration phase comes in and goes in line with the final objective of the multi-source evaluation is to achieve the integration of the results of those evaluated. We don't want the form, we, we want something tangible, we want something to to transmit afterwards to the employee. The last step raises the question of what to do next. Carrying out 360 feedback without designing the subsequent actions doesn't make sense, right? The leader of that evaluated worker, and always in line with the organization itself, must have planned the implementation of development processes for the evaluated workers in relation to those areas of improvement that have emerged in the evaluation. So for example, you have one employee that excels in selling, so maybe you don't need to make an action plan for selling for that person, but maybe his or her rates about uh, teamwork are are not as good as as uh, selling. So make a, a plan about teamwork. Maybe a training. Maybe I don't know, other kind of integration, right? This process and the set of techniques and actions planned for the development after the evaluation make up the improvement plan. So we set the we set up the stage for working through the next period that can be a year. We set goals for the next uh, performance appraisal. Uh, if the person is lacking teamwork, so we we can set the goal of reaching a better evaluation in teamwork competence, for example. But there are, there is a series of conditions uh, for success of performance appraisals. Uh, we can just run this human resource practice because it's quite complex and uh, can be costly. So we need to make sure that we uh, uh, fulfill these conditions. We have to be in an appropriate company's evaluative moment. Maybe we have worse problems to worry about at the moment. We, maybe we are in the middle of a crisis uh, that is affecting other sectors. Uh, so focus on that and then, and for example, it can be a company that is starting it's in a first year or second year. Focus first, first on growing and setting your product, marketing, etc., and then wait for other years uh, to, to start worrying about performance appraisals. There must be a clear will and support by management. If management is not involved in performance appraisals, it's not going to work. I can guarantee you that. The appraisals purposes. Uh, must be known for everyone in the company. So everyone in the company should know that performance appraisals are going on and what the objectives are and that they are not going to be uh, used for taking decisions about administrative uh, aspects of the, of the jobs, of the working conditions, right? There needs to be a favorite climate and participation culture. As I was saying, we need to form a committee to, to prepare the the performance appraisal. If people don't want to participate, we can't run this. The jobs need to be clearly defined because if they are not, we cannot extract the important competencies. Okay, we cannot create the form. If we don't really know what the jobs are about, we cannot assess them. That's quite logical, but we need to uh, be aware of this. We cannot. We need to make things in order first. Clarify your jobs, and then assess the performance of those jobs. And finally, we need to have a concrete philosophy about the employees, because if we are talking about the development, we need to 
have a concise uh, philosophy about the employee. We need to have a leadership role, uh, developmental perspective. Uh, you have here the theory X and theory Y that is classical from the 60s, from MacGregor. And uh, makes a big distinction uh, of people depending on if you have a more X theory or Y theory. So, you need to first ask yourself what are people like. If you answer yourself as a manager that your employees are lazy, are loafer, they are reluctant to change, their personality is formed during childhood, and there's no way that they are going to change. Before we said the personality traits are quite immutable, yes, but uh, if you believe that not, all, not only the the personality that also the behaviors are not going to change. Maybe you are not ready to perform performance appraisals. But on the other hand, if you believe that people are active, that they have interests, that they get tired because of routine, that they need to innovate, that create new things at their job, that they, they want to promote, uh, they need to grow, they have potential to grow throughout life. You have a Y theory, and maybe you are more prepared to to apply performance appraisals. Also, if you think that what motivates people are basically or only economic rewards, and that people have a fear to get fired, basically, and they are moved by this kind of external uh, motivation, and that they have material and immediate interests, maybe you are not ready to perform performance appraisals. But on the other hand, if you think that what motivates people are many things, depending on, on each person's preferences and values, each person is a different world, and uh, of course, economic rewards are an important part, but uh, once that is fulfilled, there are many other motivators that we need to take into account. Right? There are personal and social goals that people have. People can identify, identify with the causes of the organization. If, they, if you uh, get to get them to identify with your goals as an organization, you have a lot of work done. So there are also a distinction about leadership depending on if you have a more X theory or Y theory. Uh, from the X theory, you will probably think that people are basically dependent, that people are expected to be led, they, they need to be told what to do, so you have vertical relations from, with them, and that they need someone always to tell them how to do and not only what to do, that they need a close control, they need, to, they need to be treated politely, not with a real and true respect, and that they need to be pushed, then maybe that's more exterior based. And on the other hand, if you think that people are independent, most of them, and that they are able to self-manage in most scenarios, and that they can think of their own work methods, they can innovate, they can that they can assume responsibility if you let them. Some of them will want to assume responsibility and grow in your organization. That they uh, are treated with true respect and they need freedom, stimulus, and help. So you will have a more Y theory based uh, leadership, right? And in, in this hints, you already see a little bit of uh, after we measure job performance, how to improve your performance. Having a theory why mindset, of course I'm a, a synthetic presentation, I am uh, uh, making it uh, as simple as possible, taking from uh, classical theories to explain uh, a basic differentiation, but uh, you can see uh, quite interesting ideas of how to improve performance. Adopting a, a kind of leadership that is more why based why theory based, you can help a lot. You can do a lot of, of, the, of the process of improving your employees' performance. But in order to be a little more specific, we are going to mention uh, an intervention 
of, uh, of job performance, uh, basing our actions in transforma transformational leadership style. Uh, we already talked a little bit about transformational leadership. It is, uh, as I was saying in the other presentation, uh, pr probably the most uh, accepted leadership style nowadays. Of course, there are, there are more emerging that, like authentic leadership, emotional leadership, etc. But nowadays, this is uh, quite popular, and um, we are going to base our intervention in this kind of leadership style. So um, this uh, theory uh, depends on the kind of employee that you have with regards to motivation and competence. So for example, if you have employees with high motivation and low competence, or in other words, that they want, but they can perform, and this is normally the case of new employees, uh, the leader must become a developer, that is a teacher also, even, who accompanies and helps the apprentice, who serves as an example in terms of carrying out tasks with excellence, who transmit the culture of the team and positive emotions. So you need to be with that person, developing that person, teaching that person, because he or she is already motivated. He just needs to acquire that those competencies that he or she is lacking, and you have a part of the job done. Because when when they learn how to do things, they are motivated, so they are going to perform. What happens with employees with high motivation and high competence? Well, this is the easiest case. Uh, the recommendation is to just leave them alone because they are already performing well. Not exercise too much supervision of tasks that they carry out perfectly already. Maybe you can try to delegate some tasks. Maybe if they want to assume new challenges, you can uh, explore the possibility and delegate some tasks in them. They can, found, they can find it interesting and challenging and uh, making, make them uh, go out of their comfort zone so we avoid that they, uh, in their jobs, become uh, bored or fall into a monotonous routine, right? What happens with employees with low motivation but high competence? That is the case of people that can but uh, don't want, right? And that can but don't want, sorry. In this case, you have to work with your collaborator to understand the causes that have brought that person to that situation and propose actions that will allow him or her to re-engage in the work. Maybe a change in position or if you don't want or you don't want or you can't change that person of position, maybe you can change the tasks of that person, rotate that person in different positions temporarily maybe. Maybe you can enrich the job by uh, giving that person more job autonomy or more freedom to decide, more uh, problem resolution, or more autonomy in general to make decisions. You can stimulate job crafting. Uh, we are going to talk tomorrow about job, job crafting and other kind of crafting. But, uh, Job crafting is a proactive behavior that uh, pretends to modify the job by own initiative of the employee. So you can foster that. You can tell the employee that they are uh, in position to make job crafting if they want. And that will allow the person to incorporate other elements to their job position so you can find what motivates that person. And the worst scenario, what happens with people that don't want them and cannot perform. Low motivation and low performance, low competence. Sorry. In this case, you probably want to apply in small doses each of the recipes used in the previous three cases. Maybe you want to supervise to clearly indicate the tasks that these workers must perform, determine the completion deadlines, carry out continuous performance checks, and establish a behavioral system of rewards and punishments. So maybe you need to, in this case, be a little bit more close to that employee to see what's going on, how to fill those gaps, and 
how to motivate, how to compensate for that lack of resources or lack of competence that that employee is ex ex exhibiting. So that can be giving you a hint on what to do. So uh, this was my presentation for today, but uh, in in today's lecture, I wanted to to make you reflect at the end, uh, throwing you a series of questions to make you think about uh, what we have been uh, talking about. Okay. So for example, I invite you to think about how you would design a performance appraisal system in your company, in the case that you have a company, or even if you work in a company, how to implement that uh, human resources practice in that company, and how you would use those performance appraisals to improve the performance of the employees. Okay. You can comment on that if you want uh, now in the in the question session. You're free to participate. If you work, what kind of performance do you think that you are exhibiting? Are you, do you think that you are more like Martina, that is more centered on past performance? Or you think that are more like Petro, that are more into the context thing? I'm not going to ask you if you are focused on counterproductive work beha behaviors because, of course, I don't think that any of you steal at your work or uh, insult your colleagues or do all those kind of uh, negative behaviors, right? So I would like to to make you reflect on those aspects. It's interesting to think about that, so you can have a clear idea of what kind of be uh, behavior you have at your work. You can also think about that as uh, on your role as a student. You can also be a task performer or a contextual performer as a student also. How do you think your performance evaluations will evolve in the future? You know that we are in a very changing environment nowadays, nowadays right? Uh, from the recent decades, we are changing our work systems. We need to be uh, we need to have a lot of competencies because the, the security in our jobs is uh, decreasing more and more. With the emergence of uh, artificial intelligence, how do you think that is going to impact our performance appraisals or human resources practices in general? How is going to affect the eruption of robotics or the globalized market? So, I invite you to think about these things here. You have the last slide about the uh, references. But since you are going to have this, I go back to the previous slide. So, if you want to reflect about this or participate, you can, you can see the questions. So, it was a pleasure uh, for my part to, to give the second lesson about your performance. Now I give you all the floor if you, if you want to make any question. Also, Professor Robert, Robert Doval, if you want to make any question, comment, interest, you are all invited to participate. And thank you all for coming again and for your attention and interest. So thank you very much, Jorge. I don't know if you can hear me. I assume you can hear me. Supposedly, the microphone should work. Uh, do we have any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand and open your microphone. Today we should be able to hear you, like yesterday. <laughs>